And, and you know, how, how much better could it be if I, all I do is make plants? They say America doesn't make anything anymore. That's not true. They make coal, for one thing, and they make trees still. And, and we produce them, and we're number two. You know, we, maybe we could beat China someday if we stop, you know, exporting all our jobs over there. But we got, um, um, during my career, I've grown seven million trees and shrubs, and I see them all over the place because we sell, um, thank God for Wyoming, because during the 2008 uh, recession after the mortgage meltdown, Wyoming is still going strong. And because we had, you know, we had been in business so close to the Wyoming border that we, people before me that started growing plants that were hardy enough to stand the rigors of a much colder place than the Front Range of Colorado. And, and we still, to this day, we send a um, truckload of plants up to Casper like three times a week. So it's really something else. So a lot of these plants that you see on this list aren't that far of a drive from, from here, but we sell to Rapid Cities. There's a place in Sheridan, all over um, southern, southern Wyoming, uh, Scotts Bluff, all the way down to Albuquerque. And so uh, this is, I guess, the fourth time I've been coming up here. And I love Wyoming because I've got, um, my dad's from Beulah, and my second great-grandfather was uh, a pioneer there in the 1870s. He was, uh, he went to Deadwood, but he was just a young guy in his early 20s, and he told my, my great-uncle, was the only one that was still alive when, uh, to pass on this tale, he said, yeah, Deadwood was just filled with ruffians. He said, I got out of there real quick. So he started heading west, and he only got 12 miles to right inside the Wyoming border to, before Beulah was Beulah, and he ran into Alex Moorcroft from Moorcroft, Wyoming fame. fame. And Alex Moorcroft's buried in Beulah, and he told, uh, his name uh, was Peter Ginniger, but he went later on by his pioneer name of Bear Paw Pete. And he said, this would be a good place to have a town here once the, uh, the Native Americans get sent to the reservation because they're still camped out on Sand Creek. And sure enough, Alex was there first, so he took that homestead and made a town. And so and that's how we ended up here. So if my dad was a, uh, went away to Montana State and got his PhD, and that's how we ended up in Fort Collins. Otherwise, I would have been a fifth generation. But I'm not. <laughs> so, I still like to tell this story, especially when I'm in Wyoming. So, today I have put together a list of plants that I think should do very well for you. And, uh, you know, it's not the heart, not the, the um, easiest place to grow trees because there's a lot of things that go in against it, you know, like wind and soils are kind of lean and uh, animals, you know, deer and antelope and rabbits, you know, just making life miserable on the trees, but it can be done and it can be done successfully. I always say that, uh, you know, if we put a man on the moon, we can grow some trees in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> it just takes, <laughs> it takes some effort. And I look, I, I was, I drive through nearly every town, except for Bill, you see a lot of trees. But I saw there's some, even some guys in Bill that had a lot of trees, and I'm thinking, that guy, when he wants to sell his house, is going to be the first guy to sell it because he planted trees. and it's Because people want to live in a grove of trees, don't we? I mean, look all around Gillette. It's a town. It's just like Tree City, USA. It's really a great place. I mean, I, I, I wanted to drive around more and just to see if, if I could spot an oak. I, are there oaks here? Oh, good, because they should be, because they're, they're native to Crook County, just right next door. And um, I'll show you later on in the talk. So, yes. Oh, oh, sure, I'll, I'll speak up even louder. So um, the first plant on the list is the Wyoming State tree. 
And it's not the eastern cottonwood, this is the western plains cottonwood, it's Populus argentii. But that's not really necessarily the best tree, even though it's the, the state tree. It's because whenever the early pioneers came here, when it was time to choose their tree, where did they put their homestead? They put them down where there, there was water. And that was what's growing around every creek around in the Laramie and the North Platte and all the other, all the other rivers. And, um, but it's a beautiful tree, and if you're in a, a spot where you could plant one, by all means, choose this one. Don't get the one out of Guernsey, you know, Guern, uh, Gurney's catalog or Henry Fields. Those are the eastern ones. They're not as good. In Fort Collins, all those ones that were there, when the city forester sees storm damage on them, he doesn't try to fix the storm damage. He just cuts them off. And because they're just not very well adapted. But this one is, here is a row of them at the Cheyenne Horticultural Station. I'll tell you about that next. And you can see they're doing great. And these trees are, are 90 years old. But if you look, you'll see these um, irrigation ditches. You can see the, the valve gates along the left side. So that's what they did well there because when they were irrigating the station, they were getting the extra water. So in Cheyenne, there was a USDA station that opened up in 1929, and it was, it was a product of the Great Depression. So right after that, um, the, the USDA had had all these explorers going around the world looking for plants that would be useful to the uh, people of, of our country, and, and they start they plant them, and, in, in the, and it was really quite the thing. They had 1,500 fruit trees planted, evaluating them. They had 60 acres of trees planted in rows, and then by 1974, uh, they lost their funding and they closed the station. And since that time, they hadn't been watered until recently. So they'd been on their own devices. And we've learned so much what's happened since 74, you know, because that's nearly 50 years. You know, that's, that's 48 years of surviving a natural precipitation. And we came upon these trees, Acer tetericum, it's um, the tetarian maple, and it's from Western Asia. In a similar climate, you know, it's a, uh, here we are in the short grass prairie, over there they call it the steppe very similar climate. So when they planted these here, um, our nursery is filled with CSU horticulture graduates so nobody had heard of a tutarian maple. So we collected seed off of them, planted them, grew them up, planted them in a row, and this is what we found. We found the hot wings tutarian maple. And that one, the books, when we started reading about it, we, they said, some of the, the Samaras, you know, the helicopter seeds that you throw up in the air and spin down, that's called the Samara, are pink to red. This one's like cherry red. It's really something else, and it's hardy as can be. I know there's people here that already um, came up and said that theirs are doing great, and they're digging up the seedlings, and, and it does tend to, um, to have that trait in its seedlings, but we root them all from cutting so that they're, you know for sure you're gonna get it. It's not just a seedling because you know, with our children, sometimes they look like us, sometimes they don't look like us at all. <laughs> so hot wings is, is a great tree. Um, if you go back and look at this one, look at how, can, this picture is taken probably the year 2000, and look at those things. They hadn't been watered since 74. And they didn't start watering them in 2008. And uh, started them again when the city of Cheyenne took it over as an arboretum. And so they've been watered since 2008, but from 74 to 2000, you know, that's um, 26 years with no water and they're growing and doing great. There's three trees in a row there. You see two orange ones and a um, yellow one in the middle. Also for a maple, it doesn't have a maple-like leaf and it's got showy flowers that attract the bumblebees. So it's, 
it's something else. It's a good tree. The Cheyenne uh, Field Station was uh, um, built by a CCC camp that was on the station. There was barracks there, you know, the Civilian Conservation Corps for uh, usually it was men who were looking for work and so they would leave their towns and, and cities and go, they built the Cheyenne Station. And the one thing that was important in, in the 30s was food. You know, interstate truck, and they didn't have interstates, they just had, you know, like Route 66 and Highway 30 and all, all this, you know, t little highways town to town. But it was expensive to, to get fruit from California or, or Washington State. So if you wanted, you had to grow it yourself. That's why they tested out 1,500 fruits. But, you know, apples aren't drought tolerant. And so, that's that's an uh, apple called the Good Hue apple, and it was a top ten apple in Cheyenne. And they left it when the, when they made the recommendations in 1963. They bulldozed nearly everything because the government, you know, we did our recommend, we did our testing, we made our recommendations. It's just waste of taxpayers' money to keep these going. So they sent the bulldozer in, but. Gene Howard, who became my horticultural mentor, as an, I met him in his 70s when I was in my 30s, he said, I left the best. Because we made our recommendations. Now if people wanted them, they had a place to find them. Because he said the Good Hue came from a farmer in Good Hue County, Minnesota. And it was a top 10 apple. And so I went there and, I, and uh, this was in 1993 and it was dead. And then I went back 10 years later, and look, it's, you know, that's what happens. When you, once you tame nature, you're responsible for it, or it will go back to once it once was, and that was the grasslands. But I have no fear. I said that I saw that tree that was dead in, 90, in 93. I actually saw it in 1992, and it was still alive. It had one branch that was about two inches long. And I said, if I don't take this now and try to propagate it, it's gone forever. So I took it. And there it is in my yard. And it was top 10, top 10 apple at Cheyenne. And why is because it, it was an annual bear. It um, uh, yielded over 100 pounds of fruit on average. So much so you can see that the weight of the fruit is bending the branches to the ground. So it actually benefits from thinning. And you have bigger fruit on it. And so um, we, we grow that plant, but um, we got complaints by it. They said, this is too sour. I said, no, we prefer to say tart. <laughs> it sounds better. <laughs> but the, you know, back in the 1930s and 40s, you know, there was a lot more people that wanted a tart apple for baking because they had sugar to it or applesauce or nowadays with, uh, oh, uh, you know, hard cider. You know, you'd want to blend those things together. So I think that there's a renaissance for this plant again, especially since it's for us. And, and top 10 out of 1,500 apple trees. So this, this one, you know, I should have brought one. I'm sorry. It would have probably could have had a bidding war. Joe Biden wants his tree back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I mentioned Gene Howard is my mentor. You know, he's been passed away for a long time. He's the only guy I know that has a statue of him. He's in Lions Park in the Frontier uh, in, um, Park in, in Cheyenne. But he used to call grass green death. And it makes sense when he thought about it. Like, I never thought about it. I thought, you know, everybody just had grass around your yard and, and you'd mow it. And, you know, in the city, you know, you sprinkle your grass and you water in your tree at the same time. But if you're just putting drip or, you know, watering it sparingly or, you know, in, in the case of drought tolerant trees, just, you know, letting nature take care of them. That grass is just fibrous root system that just dominates the first t foot of soil or even deeper. And every time it does water, it goes to the grass. 
and the trees get the leftovers. And so Gene, he called it Green Death, and he says, the number one tip that I can give to people is don't let grass grow around, especially newly planted trees. This is a pear orchard in Utah. And uh, you, you know, uh, the people of Utah really have developed good irrigation projects. So they're still doing really well, but Gene Howard would not, that's a no-no, and I agree. So at my house, um, here's a plant just showing you that with uh, on, the, on the upper left, not only does it steal in the moisture from that tree, but it's more in danger of being damaged by mowing. And that can really be a serious problem, and especially, you know, people don't necessarily get that close with the lawnmower, but the weed whackers, you debark them all the time. So this is my yard. I put rings around the trees, and I mulch them pretty heavy, and it makes all the difference in the world. And uh, that was, that's a, an oak, and I planted it. I'm, I'm cheap, and so I planted it in that size, a four-inch pot. And just by keeping the grass away from it and watering it and um, fertilizing it with chicken manure, the thing is, is you know, of course I'm 60 in my 60s, so you know now those, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see there, there's all, all my trees have rings around it with mulch, and here it is. I clean out my chicken coops and I just put the bedding and the manure around the trees until it runs out. So I highly recommend that. It makes a big difference. You can't burn them? You can't burn that root with that chicken manure? No, you know, it's not pure chicken manure because it's got bedding in it too. Okay. Yeah, so, and the top dressing on it too is, you know, I would probably, you can see how I kind of moved it away from the, the tree, and, you know, so I made kind of a volcano out of it. And, and that's mostly just so that the voles and stuff don't have a really easy place to hide. And so if they get and start feeding on the, the trunk, you know, those hawks and, and owls and stuff can come down and, and get them. We have barn owls on our, we put a barn owl nest in, Lo and behold, it only took four years, before, but they found it. So it's, it's great. Um, the big tooth maple is another really great western native. You'll see that there's a, uh, there's a, I'm really trying to make the, the natives be at the top of the list. And why is because They've evolved here. They can take it when it's too dry. When we have, you know, if they're young and, it's, and you don't water it, you know, they might die. But if you supplement the water while they're young, and once they get older and, and just, they can often take it. And so the big tooth maple is a relative of the sugar maple from the eastern United States. Is one time they thought it was a subspecies of the of the sugar maple, but now they've given it its own genus. It grows all around the Wasatch Mountains in Utah, but it also grows in the Tetons by Afton. So you can see the draw. So it's a, that's a south-facing draw, and the, uh, um, the water then will pool in that draw, so it gets a little bit extra moisture when it does snow and, and rain. But the fall color is spectacular, and they're, they're, they don't get very big in Wyoming. They, can, they get like 15 to 20 feet tall. But down in New Mexico, they get to be 50 feet tall. So when I saw I was down there just on vacation, that's what my wife and I do on vacations. We just go to places in the west because you can drive there and camp. And, we found that so it was in the fall, we collected seed. I was all excited because I'd been growing the Wyoming form. And I think, if I get one 50 feet tall, well, that one from New Mexico never knew it was fall. It, uh, it thought it was still New Mexico, and, and it, it was green as can be, and then winter came, and, and never fall color, and then winter die back. So it was, that's where it's called provenance. So if you want it for Gillette, 
you want the Wyoming form. You don't want the New Mexico form. You don't want the Utah form. You want that one is the, the best. The Utah would probably be okay. The Idaho's, they grow in Idaho as well. So we, uh, that's the, the beauty of me being there for 30 years. This is one of my early trees. Look at that. It's at our farmhouse on the nursery. It's taller than, than, than that two-story house. Of course, the second story is the attic, but they made people, their kids live in it. But it's a beautiful plant, beautiful. So, you know, people used to think, oh, box elders, that's, who wants a box elder? It's a crappy tree. Well, they're crappy for people that can grow the most, any tree they want. But, but if you live here, we sh I've learned not to eliminate that just because it's, just because it's got a bad reputation in other parts of the country. Because look at that, that tree. That tree is probably 30, 40 feet tall. Look at the, the trunk on it. Um, they come in males and females. And so the females uh, have the seeds and the box elder bugs, the red and black bugs that you get on them, they feed on the seeds. And so there's a cultivar out there that was found west of Boise called Sensation with red fall color and it's a male. And we found that that tree is a great tree for Wyoming. Um, and it's become one of our top, seed, top sellers. We probably sell 300 of them or so a year in big sizes too. Here's what the fall color of it looks like. It's kind of a, it doesn't stay red for very long, but it's red and then the leaves fall off. But it does have red, but it's because it, a male, it doesn't have the problem with the box elder bugs that people, Nothing wrong with the box elder bugs except for they're, they're hardy and, you know, in the wintertime they try to get into your house. <laughs> Speaking on bugs, that's the reason why I have this on here. Do you remember, you know, when I was a kid, we'd drive around and the bugs would splash on your windshield and my dad had the joke, he said, I bet he never has the guts enough to do that again. <laughs> well... You know, I think Wyoming's probably still pretty good as far as having a, a healthy supply of insects, but the rest of the world doesn't. I don't even see blood, buds, bugs splattering on my windshield anymore. I remember like looking at the radiator and you see what butterflies smashed into your radiator. You don't see that anymore. And the reason why is that they had entomologists do an annual survey of, of bugs. And since the 1970s, 75% of the insects have disappeared. Wow. It's, it's, you know, not that they come extinct, but you know, there's only 25% of them. And they think that it's a lot of things, um, habitat loss is a big one. And uh, Roundup Ready corn and soybeans where the airplanes spray on and then it kills the weeds in the ditch that the, that the insects feed upon. And so it's an opportunity for us as knowledgeable gardeners who are here because you love trees, you love, you want to have a beautiful garden. And so we can reverse that trend because what is a city but a, an oasis of trees? It's like an urban, urban forest. And so there's a professor of entomology by the name of Douglas Tallamy, he's from back east, but he's written these books. So if you write his name down, it's like bringing nature home. And he's found that if we plant native trees and shrubs, those are the ones that insects feed upon. And he says that if an insect, if a tree leaf does not have feeding injury, it's not doing its job. And the, the exotics that we bring in, like the Tatarian maple, even though I love that tree, it doesn't really get the feeding on it because the insects don't recognize that as food. And they're slow to adopt that as a food source. And so if you're, if you're afraid of insects or you got a phobia about them, plant Tatarian maples and stuff like that. But um, it's something that's really important. When we look at birds, 
Um, birds are also decreasing numbers. And, you know, uh, robins and, you know, we put feeders out there. They'll eat all your choke cherries, they eat all your nanking cherries, your service berries. They'll feed on your seeds. But they don't feed their young that. They feed them soft-bodied insects, worms and, and caterpillars mostly, grasshoppers. And so that's why um, native plants are important. When we get to the individual species, I'll talk more about them, which ones attract the most insects that we can do to help. You know, we have dominion over this, this earth, and, and we should use part of that dominion to help the other species that live amongst us. The Ohio bug, buckeye. So when I talk about natives, I'm including North American plants. And so this one is, grows as close to, to us as, as Oklahoma and Texas. But it's a Midwestern plant, but at the Cheyenne Station, they do, have done great. It's got beautiful flowers. It's um, um, useful for uh, the nuts are edible, even though they, they, they say that there's poison in them, but um, the squirrels still eat them. And they're so terrible tasting that nobody would ever eat one. The bark on it is really fissured. There's, that's the, the nut inside. It looks like a, a, a deer's eye, a buckeye, when it comes out of there. Sometimes they're red fall color. Those three plants, the red one, the yellow one, and the orange one, those are, that's pictures taken at the Cheyenne Station. And they're still healthy like that, um, despite not being watered for so many, so many years, because they're a tap-rooted species, so that they will go down and try to find the water. Here's another one that's um, a Wyoming native, the western hackberry. You know, and it's native into the Midwest. So this is a Midwestern tree that's in a, a park. It's just a massive, massive tree. And this is one that will plant itself because um, the, the berries on it are sweet. And so the birds will take them, fly off and, and eat them, and then just eat the, the, the coat. Often they're called sugar berries, and then drop the seeds, and they'll grow in low water use situations. You can see there that I think that's uh, Goshen County, Wyoming, where they're native to. They're barely native into Colorado too in along the Republican River there. But it's a uh, um, it's a fantastic plant and it's one of my personal favorites because we have ones that just birds dropped it, planted in my yard and 15 years later they're 20 feet tall. So um, there's, it's a great shade tree, but there's, uh, the bark is really interesting. It's got fissures and um, um, but it does have a problem. It has these. They're called hackberry nipple galls and it's caused by an insect that lays its eggs on the, it's about the size of a gnat. It's a psyllid. And then the, the larva goes inside the leaf and causes these galls. And a lot of people say, what's wrong with my tree? Well, it doesn't ever harm the tree. It just makes it, it's cosmetic. And so I started thinking about that for a moment. And um, that's a model that was before and after picture, before makeup and after makeup. And look, her, she's got blemishes just like that. So I would still date her. If I was, you know, 30 years younger, <laughs> that's the way I would think with, uh, with the hackberry. You know, I would just overlook the flaws. And this is what, in Grandview Cemetery is uh, our pioneer cemetery, and a CSU entomologist saw a yellow-throated warbler just eating the psyllids when they hatch in the fall, they, they hatch as adults and then drop down into the soil and overwinter as adults in, in, the, in the leaf litter. And so these guys are just, oh man, this is like a smorgasbord. 
So they just eat them up. So this is another plant that will feed the birds. So another picture of a tree from the Cheyenne Station, a Russian hawthorn. These, these were actually sent from the Volga River in Russia in 1929. So these trees are, are 93 years old, still alive. They're only there, they're only like oh, 15 feet tall and maybe 18 feet wide, three of them in a row. They're covered with white flowers in the spring, so much so that they look like a cotton ball so much. They're really showy. And it's a, a hawthorn, so it's got small thorns, but not really big long look like some of the hawthorns has. But then the fruit on it is very showy and, and glossy, uh, bright red. And so that fruit then falls on the ground and um, wildlife eat it. So this is one of the best plants that came out of the Cheyenne Station. It's a Rocky Mountain juniper that was found in a windbreak in the 1930s in McPherson, Kansas. Just, it was probably one of those, you know, like we got to stop the, the uh, loss of our topsoil, so let's start planting windbreaks. And so they, they you know, had government nurseries just grow uh, Rocky Mountain sea, uh, junipers by the thousand. And so one of them turned out to be just this pencil point. Nobody could figure out how to propagate it in great enough numbers, and we finally figured it out about eight or nine years ago. So now we're, we're growing about 2,000 of them a year. And so if you have like a, an eyesore view on one side of your yard, but you don't want to plant something that's going to get, take up half your backyard, that's what you plant. So it only has like three feet, takes up three feet of your backyard, plant them close enough together so that you still have a screen to, to uh, block the view. Or, you know, like if you've ever been to Tuscany, you know, the Italian cypresses, you could try to line your driveway with that just to give it kind of a, a European effect. Or I've seen them in St. George, Utah, where the Italian cypresses are used like that in Las Vegas and Las Vegas, Los Angeles. But this is not, those aren't hardy, but this one is. The, this is taken at the Laramie County Community College, so they must have rooted a few of them at the Cheyenne Station and planted them in that planting around the, the college in Cheyenne. So just seedling Rocky Mountain junipers are, are great, you know, and as a windbreak. So one of the things if you plant a windbreak of, of evergreens like that, it's going to make your the rest, if you have a big enough uh, piece of land, it's going to give the rest of your garden, your yard, a more of a chance for a hospitable environment for your other trees and shrubs that you do plant. The ponderosa pine, you know, that you know, you're uh, this is the western pine, you know, probably don't need to talk about this one, everybody knows about this tree. Um, but one thing that about it is, do you know that if you smell it, it smells exactly in the summertime, it tastes like, uh, smells like vanilla. And so it, sometimes you're walking in the forest and you go, what, where's vanilla? So it's coming from the bark of the, of that uh, ponderosa pine. So the Colorado blue spruce, that's another great tree for for here. Um, it's not necessarily the best plant for planting in your front yard because when they, those people planted that, they thought, oh, look at this thing, it's so cute. <laughs> and now it's like they're going to have to start shearing it because it's growing into their driveway and taking up their whole front yard. So you have to be careful because they don't stay small. But it's still a beautiful plant. Uh, you can see there it is at more appropriate use, just as a windbreak, uh, maybe to, to uh, along their driveway. But there is maybe a better one for here, and it's the Black Hill Spruce. And the Black Hill Spruce isn't as blue, but it's from just one county over. And look at this. That's the range of the white spruce. And if you look really close, 
That's the Black Hills. So it's a disjunct population of the white spruce that grows up to the, um, you know, way into, way into Canada and Alaska. And, and if you just compare the two, Picea pungens, the Colorado blue spruce on the right, that's a Wyoming native. It grows in the Tetons and around the Medicine Bow. But that's about it in Colorado and Utah and scattered places. But compared to the, to the Black Hill spruce, which is a subspecies of the white spruce. And that's why the uh, Picea glauca densata is the Black Hill spruce. And so that's the one that just happens to, have to grow in the Black Hills and nowhere else. So it, it's, it's a really great one. So um, the bur oak. And so you're in luck today. I will be going to talk about the bur oaks, but we brought some. But uh, let me tell you about them first. And they're part of the, the raffle. The, uh, macrocarpa means large seed. And so in Texas and Tennessee and Oklahoma, they can be as big as chicken eggs. And what we found is that the ones that this Wyoming native grows in Crook County and, and in the Black Hills of South Dakota, they're smaller seeds. They're only about, here. well, here I brought one. It's like that big. That's not a large seed. And what, what that it means is that in order for it to fill its, it's nut. All the ones that had the genetics for a large seed didn't have gro enough uh, growing season. So only the ones that had smaller and smaller and smaller seeds were they able to survive and pass on, drop their acorns and have them grow to pass on. So all the ones from the north are smaller seeds. And so when we go to collect our, our, our seed, we always, when we find a small seed, we go, that's the one we want. Because then, that because the acorns are really important uh, a food source for wildlife. And even the Native Americans, they would uh, use it and they'd make uh, they make it into powder and they would float it in the river in like buckskin's pouches and leach out the tannins and it made it bitter. And so they were able to make uh, flour out of the acorns. So. Um, people will say that, oh, I don't know about the oaks. You know, they're so slow growing. Well, this, this quote by Elton True, Trueblood, he was a, a, a Quaker, a, a leader in the Quaker church, and he said, a man has at least made a start at understanding the meaning of life when he plants a shade tree knowing he may well n never sit under it. And that's kind of true, especially if you're an older man. I remember the there was a professor uh, by the name of Dr. Harrington. He wrote the Manual of the Plants of Colorado, and he was long retired, and he was 92 years old, and he came into the nursery with a cane, and he was kind of hunched over, and everybody knew Dr. Harrington, and, and the owner of the nursery came out, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait on Dr. Harrington. And he said, hi, Gary. Hi, Dr. Harrington. He said, I'm looking for a bur oak. He said, you're in luck. We ha we, I think we have some left. Brought him there, and it was the one left. And it was in a five gallon pot and it was, you know, the last one is the one that nobody wanted. It was only this tall. Dr. Harrington looked at it and he says, you got anything bigger? <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's it. He goes, all right, that's all right, I'll take it. So that's kind of what Dr. Harrington was talking about right there. And it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because these trees can live two, three hundred years old. So it's already, even if you planted it when you're 20, it's still for the next generation. So it's, it's great. So these trees here are exactly not even one years old. They still have the acorn where they sprouted out of them in, in there. And there's 32 of them. So we do a few of them. Let's do a few of them. So okay, did everybody get donated those for us to do for door prizes. So. You're welcome. So 
the last three digits, 969. Now, some people dropped theirs, and I kept them. You got it back there? Do you want, do you want to come up and grab one? We'll do, how many should we do? Let's do six. Which one? Yeah, um, that looks like a good one. It's got a nice, strong bud nine up top. Nine. Should bring them to you if you just want to. Yeah. Shake it off, baby. Can I ask you a question? Yes. I have a bunch in my backyard now. Did I plant them? Nine, five, one. How, f how far did you plant them apart? You know, I've done that too. He asked if he, he has bur oaks only planted about four feet apart. I do that a lot. And, and I always think, well, that's how they are in the forest. And I've seen people, big ones, where they're almost growing together. But if they're only about this big or so, I'd probably move it, give them more space. Oh, no, don't. Just leave them. It'd be too, it's too late. Ours never branches out very much. I mean, it maybe goes out this far. And it must be like 25 foot high. I've, she's got one that the burrs don't grow out, but it's more of a columnar one. Yeah, the trunk is probably that big now. But it never... So, you know, like, just like that Woodward juniper. Yeah. It might be a columnar form. It doesn't look very good, though, does it? <laughs> Is that a good? Okay. All right. So there's more if you don't, you know, there's a lot of them left, so I don't think we'll be able to satisfy everybody, but um, makes me wish I'd brought two flats because I do like to satisfy everybody. <laughs> so this is also another Wyoming native, the gamble oak. It grows in... Uh, on Saratoga along right when the, the North Platte comes out of Colorado into Wyoming. And it's, um, it's a suckering species. And so it's talk about good wildlife habitat, you know, make the coyotes work harder for their rabbits. <laughs> but, and so they, that particular species grows in in Saratoga and in northern Colorado, south of Denver, they don't grow in uh, north of Denver until they get into Wyoming. And they also grow in, in the Black Hills high up. So you see the gambles up there. But a as you go further south, it's an interesting thing has happened, is that during the last ice age, which ended, I think it was 25,000 years ago, um, we weren't covered with ice. It was, you know, despite what we see in movies, you know, like everybody's, you know, like frozen, everything's frozen. No, it, they still had summers. They still had growing seasons. It was just cooler and wetter. And so the eastern oaks, like the bur oaks, came into Colorado and New Mexico, and they mixed with those. And so because the, the bur oaks and the gamble oaks are so closely related that they can accept the pollen back and forth. And so, because the bur oaks are so much bigger, the pollen just showered over the, the gamble oaks. And, they, and when the ice age ended, it was too hot and too dry for the pure bur oaks to live without supplemental irrigation. And they left behind hybrids. And so you can see the difference between those and these, and that's taken from Baca County, Colorado, pretty far south. And, uh, and then look at, you can see the various individuals where the, the suckering will end, the yellow one and the orange one will come and the red one will come and another yellow one. So you can see where each one of them ended. So they make this beautiful tapestry and uh, and I talked about the birds, oaks, the number one plant that you can plant for, for caterpillars to feed the birds. There's over um, 557 
different caterpillars that feed on 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 the on these the genus Quercus of various forms across America, and and thus given opportunity for food just from the, the creatures that feed on them. So it's really an important. And number two was prunus, which is the cherry and plum family. So those are probably the top, and there's a lot of them that can grow up here. We'll talk, we'll touch base on them. So the gamble oak times the bur oak, th this is the naturally occurring one. This, is, this can take very drought conditions and um, makes a tree form plant. Here's an old pioneer stone house with these, these uh, hybrids growing. But it's not just there, it's here. So the ones that are growing the black at the Devil's Tower are the same cross. So if you look at the, the acorn, it's, um, it's from the hybrid between the gamble and the macrocarpa. So here's a very interesting plant from the Shine States. Who ever seen a, have anybody ever seen a lilac that big before? Yeah, it's a, a very rare plant from China called the Peking tree lilac. The bark is cinnamon -y and dotted and exfoliating. And then the flowers are about a foot long and eight inches across and they're always white. And they, they, they're not as sweetly fragrant as a regular lilac, but they, they're still fragrant. Well, um, I happened to visit Chicago. I was invited to collect seed at the Morton Arboretum, which is the Morton Salt people in Chicago. They have 2,000 acres of trees. And I couldn't believe what I saw. That tree is, a, is the Peking tree lilac from the same collection that came out of China from the one at the Cheyenne Station. So this is what you get when you have 40 inches of rain and 40 feet of topsoil <laughs> versus what we have here in Wyoming. But even still, you know, that picture, I said, have you ever seen a bigger one? Nobody had, so it's still a really interesting plant to, to plant. And the fact is that the Cheyenne Station just tells you how tough and drought tolerant it is. Now we're getting to shrubs. Um, you know, you can't talk about adaptable plants without bring, talking about the, these uh, Artemisias, the tall western sage, you know, like I saw them all over the place on, on the drive up here. The, you know, like I, I used to sell plants at the Cheyenne farmer's market and I'd bring yuccas and sage and he goes, what, you're trying to sell those up here? If you just go dig them up. But, you know, you always say you can dig them up, but when you try it, they usually don't live. <laughs> so if you want them, you should just get a nursery to, a nursery grown one. But it's, it's ever blue or ever, ever sil silver. They keep its foliage. Very important as a browse plant for wildlife. There's 165 million acres of sage land in the western United States, and it's home to 350 species of wildlife. And and so it's a really important one for us. Another one that's native, I see this one um, um, in Goshen County and, and uh, Guernsey, around Guernsey. It's a silver sage and it's suckers, so it makes it kind of a big, a big patch, but very beautiful uh, with these light green flowers and it's also browsed by, you know, uh, by deer especially, probably antelope as well. And then, so we're talking about grasslands here. Both those plants grow naturally in our grasslands. And that's where, we, that's where I live in Colorado and that's where you live here, is a, is a short grass prairie. And so the plants that can, can coexist and still grow in, outcompete the grass are really important plants for being able to be drought tolerant plants and these rabbit brush um, are one of them and so it's it's a member of the sunflower family the flowers are really beautiful in, in the fall when a lot of things are, are 
finished blooming, so it gives you some color. They only, maybe the tallest one might be five feet tall of this, particularly in the tall green rabbit brush. So it's a great one, but there's a dwarfer one. It's called the dwarf blue rabbit brush, and that only gets to be about 18 inches tall. So if you have a, a border that's a, a drought a tolerant border where you want to have something that's not going to cover up a shrub that you have or a tree behind there, that's a really good one to get. Now, they, those two do hi, hibernate or uh, hybridize with each other. So when we go to find these, we have to find them where they're only these. And so on the road from Fort Collins to Laramie, we see them. And we have to drive about five miles beyond where we see the tall green ones to get the, the pure um, ones where they haven't been pollinated by the bees and, and makes them into hybrids. Um, the Siberian pea shrubs are really an interesting plant. It's, um, they're from China and Mongolia. Karagan is the Mongolian word for the pea shrub, that, hence the name Karagana. And microphylla means small leaf. And so when you, this is at the Cheyenne Station, and it was a cultivar that was selected out of Manitoba, so that's north of North Dakota, so you know it's really hardy. Um, it's, it doesn't have seeds, so it doesn't spread around where a lot of people will, wouldn't like that. And so um, it also is a member of the pea family. And have you ever seen um, peas and beans where you can put inoculant on the roots and so it can fix nitrogen? Well, um, there's a large amount of agronomic crops like peanuts, soybeans, alfalfa, garden peas, cow peas, fava beans, uh, green beans. They um, sell this bacteria called rhizobium and you just coat your seeds with it and plant them and it takes nitrogen gas which is inert and our, our atmosphere is like 70 percent inert nitrogen gas but it, it's really quite stable but that bacteria f fixes itself on the root and it changes the nitrogen into a nitrate which is available to feed plants because nitrogen is the number one thing that people want to to fertilize their their plants with and it comes straight free from the atmosphere so the pioneers there's some native ones um, not carrageens but closely related called amorphas are the lead plants and the people before they knew the science would say oh don't plant amorphas because they they rob your soil of fertility but it was the other way around. They were able to grow in poor soils because they were feeding themselves with the symbiotic relationship with this rhizobium. So the carrageenas have that. And we put that on our seedlings so that when you do plant them, you already have that bacteria in case because it wouldn't be native to our soils. So we put it on there so you already fix the nitrogen when you get the plants. This is a, uh, another one that fixes nitrogen, and this is the curl leaf mountain mahogany, but it's a different one. Um, the curl leaf mountain mahogany is a broadleaf evergreen. It, here, that's in uh, northern Utah at, on the Idaho border. That's Bear Lake behind there. But here it is in the bighorns. So you can see how that tree is probably 500 years old. And the, the deer um, browse it, so you can see where, and the small ones are browsed forever. So you had to kind of protect them um, if, you, if you're going to try to make a tree out of it. Of course, you know, you, it'd be your, your 20th great-grandchildren would be trying to <laughs> make a tree out of a 500-year-old plant. But there's the seed of it. It's curlicued, and it's got an interesting... Uh, ability to plant itself. So the wind blows the curlicue and it carries in the wind and lands. And when it rains, the curlicue uncurls and stands straight up. And because it's rained, 
the water or the, the soil is, is moist and when the sun comes up first it dries the curlicue and it curls back up and it corkscrews itself into the ground. So it plants itself. It's really an interesting phenomenon. And that's the bacteria that infect the roots. I should say it doesn't infect it, it inoculates it. It's a beneficial bacteria, it's called Frankia. And uh, so we put that on them as well, just so that you, you already have it. But it's probably here because that is a native plant, whereas the carrageena, the, the pea shrub, is a Chinese plant. Apache plume. Um, this is a picture taken at the Denver Botanic Gardens. And um, it's a member of the rose family. Here it is in southern Colorado. Um, and showing the flowers. Here's a close-up of the flowers. You see it looks just like a rose. But it lives, at, it's been at the Cheyenne Station since 1940. Um, I know professors at, in Laramie that have it in Laramie. I think there's people here that have it. Janet has it from the Master Gardeners, and it's a very drought-tolerant plant, and she's got it in a low-lying area where she doesn't really irrigate it, but when it does water, you know, the water goes to where it is and then sinks in. And then that's why they call it the Apache plume because the seeds are glistening in the sun. So it's got a long period of, of interest. The New Mexican privet, here it is trained to be a, a to more like a, to show its bark because its bark is almost, it's really uh, blonde color. But the, the, it's male and females, the females are covered with these, these blueberries that when the robins and the cedar waxwings find it, they strip it. And so they're, that, this picture here is right outside our office. So whenever we come out of the office, when nobody's been around there, the birds just fly out of it when, when they, when it's ripe. Here's a picture of the Cheyenne Station. 70% of the plants have died since they closed the station in 74. And Gene Howard, my mentor, was stationed me in this position. And I took the picture just because I want to illustrate what I was looking at when he tricked me. He said, Scott, look down that row and see all the mock oranges. There's 200 of them from planted from around the world. And I looked down the road and I knew what mock oranges were and he goes, I don't see any mock oranges. He goes, exactly. It's because 198 of them died. Because they, once they closed the station, they couldn't make it. But now turn around and he turned around and he goes, but those, they survived. Because this is the state flower of Idaho. It was found on, it's Philadelphia's Lewisi cultivar called Cheyenne. It's called Lewisi because it was named after Mary well, Meriwether Lewis from the Lewis and Clark expedition. And uh, brought back for the first time and planted at the Cheyenne station. And it, there's a herd of deer that now live at the station and they ate all the other mock oranges to the ground. But because this one evolved with mule deer, the mule deer don't like it. And so they left it alone. And it's beautiful. It's sparse blossoming there, but you bring it into cultivation. That's what the flowers look like. They smell exactly like an orange blossom. It's, it's great. Here's the um, a yellow fruited choke cherry. We changed the name because yellow fruited choke cherry wasn't glitzy enough, so we changed the name to yellow bird choke cherry. And I used to tell people, look at, look at the yellow fruit. Imagine the choke cherry jelly that you could make out of that, Have, ne never having done it. So I decided to do it. And well, it's not yellow. It just turns brown. <laughs> so you're probably better off with just the purple one. But when you see that from a distance, you really s it looks like it's blossoming in August. And this one is found along Horse Creek between Cheyenne and, and Wheatland. 
1932. And so it was at the Cheyenne Station, we just rooted from cuttings. So you're getting the same one that was found in the 30s here in Wyoming. There's what the flowers look like when they're just before they open up and then when they do open up. So here's one. Do you know, everybody's probably heard of the Canada Red Choke Cherry, right? Canada Red was, is a great tree. It's more of a shrub that people train it as a tree, but it's not a tree, it's a shrub. And so it suckers, and it suckers from the root badly, especially older plants. And so if you have it in your yard and you're mowing your yard, you're mowing off the suckers. And if you go into your backyard with bare feet, you're stepping on these suckers that you mowed off and it can be painful to your feet. So a lot of people that have that, an older plant of the Canada Red Purple Leaf Choke Cherry, don't like it for that very reason. And, but I found this tree in Helena, Montana, where every winter gets 40 below zero. And I didn't find it. It was a, 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 another mentor of mine, Clayton Berg, who had a nursery in Helena, and he'd been watching it for 35 years. He says, it's never suckered. And um, he let, he, it's a long story, I won't tell this story, but out of guilt, he gave me this one. I will tell you the story, because now you're probably wondering what the guilt was. I flew all the way up there to get another plant, and he said, I'll give it to you. Flew out all the way up there. I was only making like $8 an hour at the time. And um, it was dead. And I flew all the way up there, and so he said, well, I want to show you this to make up for it. I wasn't going to give you to this because this one could be valuable. Never sucker. So he gave me this plant, and we planted it in, in, in 2000. He'd been watching it for 35 years, so now it's been 50 years never suckered. And that's what these are. It's been, I, I patented the plant, and then I gave it to my alma mater, Colorado State, and not 100% generous because we split the royalty and they promote it. And so the new growth comes out green and then gradually changes to purple by the end of, this, um, end of July. It's all purple and never suckers. This so is the, the same thing as a Canadian red choke cherry except it doesn't sucker? It doesn't sucker. And so the thing is, is that it has to be Canada red seedling that that mutated or crossed with some other prunus that we don't know about what it is because we only know that the, the purple leaf uh, come from Canada Red. So here's the Canada Red after um, just suckering. So people have to like cut the suckers off unless you want it to be just a big shrub. But sucker punch never. Yeah, let's do plugs. that. Yeah, sure. Four, two. All right. <laughs> we'll do one more. Now, didn't you say you had enough trees? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All these we're going to be doing for drawings, so future tickets. Nine, three, six. Oh, awesome. you're welcome. So those of you who have gotten the trees and the ones that will get them later on, 
These pots are called root maker pots and they're really hard to keep wet once they dry down. So we have to water them over and over again to get them, to get them wet because they're open on the, on the bottom and on the sides. And so they really dry out a lot. So what I recommend to keep them alive while you're doing is either pot them into a slightly bigger pot that's you know, like a one gallon pot or keep them in that pot until the weather gets you know nicer and just dunk them dunk them in a five gallon bucket until no no longer the air bubbles come out that's how i usually do it so the, the root maker pots really make a great pot and it's great for nurseries so that you don't have to worry about circling roots in the pot which can be a problem so both of them are made in in root maker pots Okay. All right, here's another Western native. There's a lot of these growing in Wyoming. Um, I know around uh, Newcastle, I see them all different colors. They usually, they usually come in black or gold but sometimes they're every color in between to red to orange to gold to purple. They're, they're, this one was found um, to have extremely, uh, extreme vigor. There's an, a woman who worked at the nursery, her name was Gwen. So we just named it after her. So Gwen's buffalo current. Um, the flowers are really showy. It's also commonly known as the clove current so it smells like cloves. And not just slightly like cloves, you can be 20 feet away when the whole bush is blooming and smell cloves coming to your nose and saying, what is that? It's really, really a neat smell. And then there's a, we sell two cultivars, the Gwen's Buffalo Current and then the Crandall Clove Current. Crandall was found in the 1880s in Kansas and they've never found one as big as Crandall ever since. And so we've just kept this one going. Um, the fruit's really big. And you know how a lot of people say, yeah, it's edible. These currants are edible. And so you try currants and you think, hmm, I suppose if I was lost in the woods, you know, I could survive on these. But these are so good that if you pick that handful, you'd probably just eat them all. It's really probably one of the best tasting uh, currants that we can grow here. And on top of it, it can grow in, in a shadier spot, so which is important because it grows uh, underneath where there's a little bit more moisture. So there's trees usually there where there's more water. And then it has red fall color. So it's got, really, it's got everything going for it. It's probably one of my favorite. In my yard, I've got like nine of them. I really, I really like the, the clove currants. So um, this is one that has gone nationwide. And I found it growing in a side yard in Fort Collins. And I saw it like that as I was driving down the road. I said, what is that? It looked like a silver dollar eucalyptus, you know, that you'd buy in a, in a florist shop. And so I slammed on the brakes, parked the car, and went and knocked on the guy's door. And this uh, man in his 80s answered the, the door. And he goes, oh, yeah, that was my grandfather's plant. He was a worked at Iowa State in the horticulture department in the 1890s. And when my, when my dad's brother died in 1905 as a baby, my, my grandfather planted on his grave. And in 1930, he said that my brother followed in his, father's, his grandfather's footsteps and went to go visit the grave in 1939 and rooted it and sent it to the other members of the Kinsley's families as a family heirloom. And so I, had, I asked them if I could propagate it. And then when everybody went, you know, you know starry-eyed, wanting this plant, oh, this is a great plant. The, uh, I went and asked them, Do you, we're going to name it Kinsley's Ghost because it looks like white uh, souls. And it was the cemetery, and it was because the family name was Kinsley's, so he said yes. So now I've seen it in the Wall Street Journal because they have what's called moon gardening where white flowered plants 
that you can see them at night. So this was, this was spec because of that. So here's what the flowers look like. And so the, that, that round disc behind it is called a bract. So when the flowers come out in a, an abundance, they start to turn green to, to, to gray, and eventually they turn to white. So the whole thing is covered like that. We find it, it, it grows up a trellis by twining. So if you give it some sort of a, like I use um, copper, you know, now you probably won't want to use copper because it's probably really expensive, but I made copper sticks just from Home Depot and stuck them in the ground and let them, let them grow up. And then I put them on the east side of my house and I fastened it with a U uh, connector to my eaves. And so it just kind of grows up around there. It's, re it's really beautiful. Yeah, so that first picture is from Mr. Kinsley's yard. That's what the picture I took that day when I saw it. And that's on the east side of his house. So it's getting morning sun, and then the rest of the day was, was um, shade. But I've, it's all over the Denver Botanic Gardens now. And so you'll see it in a various um, different you know, shades to full sun. So, and that's native to the eastern United States. So it's, um, I don't know, you know, in the 1890s, maybe it was like, a, a, you know, a better variety. I don't know, but, you know, that, that's lost to, to time. Now, the Nanking cherries, that's it from northern China. That's a 50 below zero plant. And thing to know about Nanking cherries, you should have two. Just like a lot of like apples, you need two, and um, sweet cherries, you need two. A lot of things, you, pears, you need two. Same with the Nanking. So you need to at least have two, and it could be two seedlings. Um, every flower seems to become a cherry if you have two. They're draw, they are frost tolerant. So I've seen it at 25 degrees when they're full. Um, full flower and they still set fruit. So they're being from northern China where every winter is 50 below zero, it's just, you know, evolved that way. So, but the problem with these is that the birds love them so much. So they just will get almost all of them. So if you want them, you can net them. Because they're not that big. They can be 10 feet tall in old age, but it takes them a long time to be that. So they're usually five feet tall or so. You can net them, but here's the one. So you could have that one, the red one, be for the birds. And then you could have this one be for you. This is a white a variant that was found in Saskatchewan. And the birds don't know it's ripe. They're waiting for it to turn red. <laughs> and so they n have yet to find it. Maybe if you had hungry birds they would try it, but you get to have all of them. They taste just like the red one. So the last plant we'll talk about, this is another from the Cheyenne Station. It's called the Early Lilac. Now, the Early Lilac, you, you'll have a hard time finding it. But I just showed you this because it's a hybrid I'm going to talk about last between them. This is an old plant. These were planted in the 1930s. Look at it. It's just round like a gumdrop clear to the bottom. If you compare that to the, to the regular common lilac on the upper, upper, when they get old, they're naked on the bottom. They kind of get long in the tooth. They're not as attractive. I mean, they're still attractive because that's what we're used to. But when you compare it to the early lilac, it's got a much better growth habit. Well, in Canada, they cross the two. And that cross is called Syringa hyacinthiflora. And the best, so you can look for that, just hyacinth flora. And there's a cultivar listed there, it's called Pocahontas. And at the Cheyenne Station, oh, I forgot to tell you, and also the fall color is great. So one of the few lilacs that has great fall color. And so Pocahontas, you can see that just abundant flowers, the same growth habit as the early lilac and it has much better fall color. So look for the hyacinth floras as one that you can plant here, just have a, a better form and abundance. So 
poke on to the Cheyenne Station is almost always at the top of the list when people see it in bloom because it's just so abundant. All right, well, that's it. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, it sure will, yes. Okay. We also have a cultivar that came out of the University of Minnesota in 1950 called Orient, and it's a superior one. And so you could buy Orient and plant it with White Delight, and that would work. Or, you know, when I say superior, it's just slightly better. It's bigger. Uh, but when you compare them, so the seedlings usually are pretty good too. So and seedlings are cheaper as well too. So it's, um, and two seedlings would work too. Yes, sir. You know, I, I got a bunch of black walnuts in my backyard, but evidently they don't flower. They just make a seed. Is that right? I've never seen them flower, but I've seen their seed on the ground. Do, hmm. Don't they flower? They do flower. So they're they have catkins. So these catkins, they kind of look, that's the catkins you'll see on birch, and they kind of look like long foxtails that kind of hang down. They're fuzzy. And that's the male flower, and so the dust, you know, the pollen will come out, and the, 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 the female flower is almost, you have to really look for it to see it. I, that must be it, because I, I see the seeds all over my yard. Yeah. You know, that, my granddaughter's hands really good. <laughs> right. But I, I've never seen a flower. Yeah, that's yeah, what it is. The, is there a certain time of the year I should be looking for that a little more than around oh, here? I think it'd probably be in June, probably June? when it would bloom, maybe okay. May. Probably June here. You know, in Colorado, they're, they're, they're losing them all because there's an insect coming up from Arizona and Texas and New Mexico that kills them. So almost everyone in Four columns are gone now. Sad. The other thing I've done is my peach trees in my backyard, the peaches don't get very big. But I only have one, but I get peaches, they must be self pollinating. Is that correct? They are self pollinating, and that's the interesting thing. There was when I was a young guy, I was so into just horticulture. And when I met my wife, he's like, You're a great plantsman. What do you like to do for your spare time? He's, I like to read gardening books. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, me too. So like, we got married like a year later. <laughs> but uh, um, I was reading about Thomas Jefferson. And it was like, because Monticello, his, his estate is a, is a garden. And so Monticello had a, a, a bunch of his diary or letters that he had corresponded with and he says he was corresponding with a Frenchman and, and he made copies of, he would write and he had a machine so that he would write and then the machine would copy down exactly what he was writing so he kept copies of all his correspondence that way it's really interesting so in this one he said in America we don't graft our peaches we just plant the seeds because they're self fruitful and and so they pretty much um, the same as the parent. They don't differ very much. So that's so you you can just plant your peach pits. That if it's a hardy one that grows around here, I would save those peach pits, learn what it needs to germinate them, and, and grow. Mm -hmm. Apricots are the same, but there are some apricots that, that do, do need to some here. I, I've run in that, I, I don't know. Yeah, and, but that's so common here. It's, there, it's gotta be perfect. Yes? You've inspired me to just pull over and maybe ask about some of the plants that are indigenous to in the area, but I have no idea how you propagate a branch from a tree, or how, how do you do that? You'll or have to you have me up next year. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe this fall or something. The, no, next 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 fall would be perfect. If Write that on your sheet. I did. <laughs> because I give a talk on how to do basic propagation. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah I think it's an interesting interesting class. Yes, Michael. Um, can you actually get many of those? 
I'm sorry, Miss Middle. Maple syrup, can you actually tap those maples for maple syrup or not? You know, I think you probably could. I wouldn't do the hot wings, probably. I would maybe try the, the big tooth. I know that um, there was a, in the, is a Civil War veteran, he's one of the early Fort Collins um, uh, pioneers. And he came and, and his grandson, he was so famous, he was in all these history books, local history books, and his grandson still lived on the homestead and I went to go visit him and he showed me the silver maple. Now I know there's silver maples here in Gillette and they would use that to tap for maple syrup because the sugar maples weren't hardy enough because the soil, they didn't match the soils, they didn't like alkaline soils as readily and so they used the silver maple and they, there's a nursery out of upstate New York called St. Lawrence Nursery and they have a silver maple that's called sweet sap that they put into tissue culture because it has higher sugar content than any sugar maples ever found. And so that might be a good one to plant because these, you know, an old, old silver maple is much bigger than a sugar maple. So what kind of silver maple did you say? It's called sweet sap. And it's St. Lawrence Nursery out of Potsdam, New York. It's one of the only zone three nurseries in the country. And it's mail order. Yes, sir. Uh, I think I have a gamble oath that probably the source, of, the initial source was you, but, uh, your nursery uh, that I, I think we got here quite a few years ago. But the, uh, is the, Gamble Oak at the KOA Campground at Devil's Tower is still the biggest you've seen? Um, I think it is, the one here for sure. Um, if you go along, uh, if you go to Beulah and you just follow Sand Creek going towards uh, Historic Ranch A, there's all along Sand Creek there, there's, it's almost solid uh, oaks there. But I don't think I've ever seen that one by the KOA as big as that one. Is, is there, my, my favorite tree is the aspen tree, and I've grown several, or a white birch. Is there a variety that you would recommend for this area? For aspen, oh, um, you know, what I recommend for aspen is not to collect them out of the wild or buy collected ones from the wild because even though you can get a bigger one and the ball doesn't have to be that big, it really stresses them out. And so we buy one-year-old seedlings out of um, a nursery in Idaho. Oh. And so there are, in one year, an aspen seedling can grow four to six feet tall and then they undercut them, send them to our nursery in bundles of 50. It's one of our number one selling <laughs> trees because everybody loves aspen. Yeah. And so we put, we, we put them in five gallons, we put the small ones in two gallons, we'll even put three in a, in a five gallon, sell it as a clump. And after one year, they're seven, eight feet tall. And when you plant them in your yard, they're not stressed out because we didn't cut off 80% of their roots by buying them from a collector who got them out of the wild. And so they do a lot better. And the other thing that you can do for, for aspens is if you look where they grow in the wild, they're, they're not down in the meadow, they're on a hillside. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is that they need to have perfect drainage. Mm -hmm. And so if you, bought some topsoil and made a berm and made a berm and planted them on your berm and that kind of emulates them growing on their own drainage and they do a lot better. Thank you. You're welcome. If we have, I have a grove of the cottonwoods that are, have suckers, I'm learning all these terms, I'm very new to all of this, but uh -huh. could we somehow take those then and plant them elsewhere on my property? You could. You could. Um, so the ones that sucker are, there's one that's called the narrow leaf cottonwood. Does it have like narrow, like peach-like leaves? That's the narrow leaf and they form 
colonies. And then there's a naturally occurring hybrid between the narrow one and then the, the plains cottonwood, and that's called the lance leaf, and that also suckers. So it's better off, in my view, is not to have a suckering plant unless you have you know, a beautiful area where you don't have to worry about it taking over. Is to plant the, just to take cuttings off of uh, Plains Cottonwood. And so all you have to do is you look at the growth that occurred last year. Like, can I just show you this? So this, this plant, when we planted last year, was this tall. Last summer, this is a two-year-old, it grew this much. This is its third leaf that's starting to bud out. So imagine this being just wintertime and they, these leaves haven't budded out. This is the growth that occurred last year. So you look at the, the freshest growth of a cottonwood and you cut it back and you'll know it's the freshest wood because you'll see the buds, nice plump buds all up and down. And all you have to do is uh, cut it. It's about the size of a pencil, cut it into eight foot pieces, stick it in the ground. <laughs> it's so easy. If anybody, if anybody knew that you would you'd never buy a cottonwood again, <laughs> you just make your own. So you don't need to, you don't need to, to dig up the suckers. And then that way, if you use the plains cottonwood, and that looks more like a, an aspen leaf but bigger, that's the one that doesn't sucker. Is the Sioux similar to the plains? The Sioux, yeah, but that's not a very good one. It, I mean, it's, it is good, it's, it's, but it just grows so fast and it's an unknown hybrid. So we don't really know what the Sioux is, but it's really a common one. So the Sergeant Strait is a, is a really good one. Or if you just found one growing along, you know, waterways, yeah. As we promote growth in our, our big cottonwoods, when do you prune them? to get the best growth and to help them to... <laughs> you shouldn't even have to prune them. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Of all their little tiny shooters? Oh, if you wanted to, to have a, you know, if the trunk's got them way down low where you can't mow around it or something, you can just prune them off in the best time. The most ideal time is like February or March. Oh. Is when you would prune those off. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Um, the oaks around here, do you guys is there a problem with the same oak death? Like oh, like in out west? Uh -huh. No, not yet. Good. And so we're, as a matter of fact, yes. we, we have, we, the Cali there's a lot of California nurseries that, that if they were just to grow plants that grew in California, there would be overkill. Because there's so, you know, California is a great place to grow trees. <coughs> And so they would go out of business. So there's California nurseries that specialize just in sending plants back to the Rockies. There's one called Hollandia, there's one called Alta, and they buy our, our seedlings. And we ship them to California, they grow them on bigger and send them back. And so at first when we were sending seedlings, California was, oh my God, you know, because there's counties that don't have the sudden oak death yet. And then, Finally, the Colorado Department of Agriculture says, we don't have it here, so we don't have to go through like inspections and that type of stuff. So we just send ours back there and then they send them back to us. So, yes? So my parents have a house in Spearfish and they have several oak trees. And then every year there's, you know, little ones that start up. What is, we've, we've tried transplanting those before. I did not realize how huge like the root system was. It's, it's never worked out for me. Um, but anyhow, how, how do you get an oak tree to start? Like if, from the acorn things? Or yeah. Like, or can you just plant those and eventually maybe? You can, but very good question. So to answer your question about how to do things, I'm gonna give you a secret right now. Oh, what's the secret? Oaks, <coughs> acorns, if you're allowed to dry out, they die. So I've, I've uh, I learned when I was a kid, I would collect the acorns and put them in my pocket, and then I'd empty my pockets out at the top of my dresser. They'd sit there for two weeks and I'd plant them and nothing would grow. 
is because it's a type of a seed called recalcitrant. And if the, the moisture level drops below 16 degrees, they're dead. So they actually are necessary for man to keep them from drying out or squirrels to bury them and forget about them. <laughs> and so when we collect acorns, we instantly take them home, pop the caps off, because I always do, I, you know, just like, what are you doing? And the boss would say, so well, I'm taking the caps off. And it just allows me to, to have an easy day. <laughs> but I think it's better. I think it's better to take the caps off. And then we soak them overnight in water, and then we put them in buckets. And it's a process called stratification. And stratification is from the Latin word strata, which means layer. So the, the stratosphere, uh, strategy of military plan that's layered, or the earth strata. So that's how you remember it. So when you take a bucket, put vermiculite on the bottom, layer of seed, vermiculite, layer of seed all the way up. And you make sure the bucket, five gallon bucket's got holes on the bottom. So when you water it, the excess water drains out and we store it in a root cellar. We have an old pioneer root cellar that it stays in the wintertime in the 30s. And just this past week, we went to check our buckets and all the bur oaks are germinating. All of them. Like so much so that it's like, ah, <laughs> I, I've got to plant 3,000 acorns today. <laughs> and so that's how you do it. So is and it best easy. to get the acorns off of the, like take them off of the tree? And yep. Then go the and process? that's what I recommend too, because in the east, for instance, you know, they'll have like thousands on the ground, but it rains a lot in the east. And so the rain may keep them from drying down. But in the west, if they fall on the ground, it hasn't rained since February of last year. Just about, you know. And so, the ones that, some of them that fell on the ground might have fallen today and they're not dead yet, but the ones that fell a week ago, they're dead already. So what we do is we just collect them off the tree in about October, late September. So the only reason you put them in the layers I mean, you're just making use of the <coughs> That's right. it. And it's just that vermiculite that we use is just holds moisture a lot. And then also there's a lot of air space in between the vermiculite particles just so that they get enough water <coughs> to uh, air. And, but you don't have to do that, too. You can just put them in Ziploc bags and put them in your vegetable cooler at home and hope that your spouse will go, what the heck are these, and throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> There's no room for the salary. <laughs> yeah, just to keep them moist, yeah. Yeah, and so if you soak them overnight, and then you put them in, in a Ziploc bag, I usually put some vermiculite in there too, but not sopping wet. And so if you see like there's water still in the bottom of the Ziploc bag, that's too much, you dump it out add maybe some more dry vermiculite. And if, and if you look at it, that doesn't look wet enough. Well, zip it up, put it in your refrigerator, look at the next day, and if it's got condensation on the bag, it's wet enough. If we wanted, I have a dream for my <laughs> acreage, basically, uh -huh. and I want to do exactly this and plant a mixture of shrubs and trees. And is there a place to go to find out the best placement of those, of spacing and combinations, like a place to look for that type of information? Yes, the uh, county extension agent. Okay. Oh, and they did a good job. I've looked at the I have recommended list <laughs> are for here, and I 100% agree. There's good, good, they have good lists. Great. Yes, ma'am. So, back to the oaks. I remember one time you were talking about how important it is to get some of the stuff from under the trees from the same place that you're collecting the oak, um, the acorn. Do you still go by that? I still do. Now, you know, because I, what she's talking about is I've talked about some other strategies is that microbes are so important. Now, you know, the human body, before I talk about the tree form microbes, the human body is 90% of the cells in the human body aren't human. 
they're, they're microbes, and they're mostly in the gastrointestinal tract. And so we don't really know what most of them do. We don't, they don't have, a lot of them don't even have names yet. And so when, when we're, plants that grow in, the, uh, in our soils have all these relationships with microbes that we're, scientists have now started to realize, oh my God, these are crucial. And there's a thing that's called mycorrhizae. It's a fungus. And 90% of the plants on Earth form mycorrhizal association. Myco means fungus, rhizal means root. And there's um, oaks, for instance, are um, specific to the oak, the fungus that grow on, like truffles. Truffles is a mycorrhiza that pigs find. And they dig up these big, um, they're like a puffball. And be, before they turn into spores, it's perfect for making food for you know fancy French restaurants. Um, and what the mycorrhizae do is that they attach themselves to the roots and then quadruple, maybe eight times the active root zone of of the root of the tree. So you know if you to give you an example, it's called my, mycelial strands. So if you if you bought artisanal bread and you, and you put it on your countertop and you look and you've got, oh, it's starting to get moldy. And then you don't do anything about it. I'm not eating that bread. And then a week later, you haven't thrown it away and the whole loaf of bread is, is all blue. Those, that's mycelial. And so it just spreads and grow up. But that's penicillin and that's a killer. It's a killer, but mycorrhizae, doesn't harm, harm the plant at all. It just spreads out into the native soil, brings back water and nutrients for the plant, and in exchange, fungus cannot make sugar. They, they, don't, they don't make uh, food that way, but the plant then sheds sugar that they make through the process of photosynthesis and share it with the mycorrhizae. So it's a true symbiotic relationship. And then those mycelial strands from another tree will come in and meet with mycelial strands from a neighboring tree. And if a tree is growing in, is in stress, like it's out in the sun, and where the other ones are in the forest and it's still got moisture, those mycelial strands will share water from the healthy trees and keep the small one in the sunny spot alive. So they're learning all kinds of things about that. It's just an amazing science. There's a book that's called Teeming with Microbes, and it tells a lot about it. And it's by Jeff Lowenstein, and it won a big gardening award about five or six years ago. Really interesting. Um, I also give a talk at Mycorrhizae that just to the University of Nebraska like two weeks ago, and um, I was kind of, a little bit scared about it because I, you know, I'm not a mycologist, and so I was worried that oh, there's probably some mycologists listening in. So, but uh, nobody complained. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Could you talk a little bit about winter watering on our trees? Especially oh, where very. We live? Yes. Oh, well, I, sh I should have brought it up. That is, that is the biggest thing that you can do to help get your trees alive. Uh, and and survive the winter because you know when I was a kid we used to get a lot of snow we don't get snow like our ground doesn't barely even freeze anymore at least in Colorado and uh, and so winter watering if you go out into you'll see your soil it'll be cracked you'll see like it might be the Sahara Desert, you know, it's, it's cracked. And so those plants, if you winter water once a month on a month that we don't get a sufficient snowstorm, it can make a big difference on success and failure. Um, I, gave, I gave a talk about, and I talked about winter watering as just a side topic. And uh, um, 
to the WGGA, it's the Wyoming Groundskeepers Association in Casper, and I overheard a bunch of grumbling from these guys, we never winter water. And that's starting, I'd like to look at those people's trees. Because they, you know, they might be doing good, but if you did winter water them, they would do a lot better. Do you have to be above a certain temperature to do that? Yeah, so the, the rule of thumb is um, above 40 degrees. And, <laughs> and it's mostly when it's um, for younger trees. Older trees, you just can't give them enough water. And usually the older trees have uh, their roots down lower where there is more water, but the younger trees in particular. Um, for evergreens, in the winter, do we still sprinkle? I mean, do they take a lot of their moisture through their leaves, or do we root water? I would do the, the roots, let them do the roots. That makes a lot of difference. Um, and it's hard to do, like our nursery, we had, uh, we do our plant, a lot of our planting in the fall of container grown plants because they're so busy in the spring. And we know, when people say, hey, my tree died. So did you winter water? No, so that's why it died. So that's what we always say. And then our own uh, foreman doesn't even water his trees. And a lot of those die because we plant them in the fall. And so we don't even follow our own device because we, we don't have enough hose to water 80 acres of trees. Yes, because yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's like you have to drag a hose out there because you can't, you know, start your water system because then you have to blow it out again. Otherwise, your water system will freeze, and crack, and ruin it. And then you have to drain your hose. It's a kind of a big thing. But with if you got just a few trees, you just fill up some buckets and walk out there and give five gallons of water to them once a month. And if you've got a good foot of snow, that's good enough for that month. Yes, sir. Uh, last year, planted several hot wing maple, like eight, 10 foot ones. Pretty good investment in, in some other trees as well. And we established our ground was soil was pretty bad. Um, we learned in some classes not to amend the soil because once it grows out of that nice soil that you put, then it gets to the bad original soil, native soil, and it's like, I'm not gonna go any farther, and it dies. But I couldn't bear not to <laughs> put a little something in there. So, I don't know, what do you recommend? I'm with you. I'm with you. I think that if you're gonna plant a sagebrush or a, a yucca or, or you know, mountain mahogany or a true native plant, then I wouldn't amend. But for a, a tree, I think it does good to men. And, and, you know, not a lot. You know, just, you know, some peat moss or finished compost or some aged manure, no more than a third of the soil, 25% of the soil, I think it makes a big difference. I, I really do. And, uh, you know, I, I, at that time, I put phosphate rock down in there. There's stuff called colloidal phosphate. I'll put some of that in the hole because phosphate is really attracted to soil particles and so the cation exchange, if you don't get it down into the, to the planting hole, it doesn't move very much in the soil. And so that's another plant that mycorrhizae really does because the mycorrhizae finds the phosphate, breaks it down and shares it with the plants. So, so but um, we can do that to help out, to help out the plants at the hole. So you're not, you know, it, it's called the flower pot effect. And I guess there are some university studies that show that they do. They kind of go, oh, I, I like it better here. So they'll turn around and go back. Yeah. And so sometimes what I'll do is at the end of the hole, especially if you have slick clay or something like that, I'll kind of cut, you know, like star shaped edges so that when the roots still go in there, they have a hard time turning around and they just go back, just keep going forward. What kind of tree was the aspen? Oh, probably not enough water. Maybe. It's right on, yeah, it's right on my sprinkler system, my yard, edge of my yard. It could be um, windburn too, maybe. Yeah, it could be just a year, but it, 
usually doesn't stay. I see that like with lindens a lot. Lindens are always burnt around the edges because they that's they don't get enough water. But well, the tetarian should be. Yeah, get rid of the grass. Yeah. I saw another person. Yes. I had a question about um, the, uh, 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 the honeyberries. They're like zone two. Oh yeah. Is that something that you recommend? And I've well, had one for three or four years, and I can't get it to bloom, and I don't know why. And I have two. Okay, ones. so she's talking about honeyberries. This new uh, edible fruit that's zone two hardy. It's yeah, well, they're, they're developing Canada, but they're from Siberia. Oh, yeah. And so the University of Saskatchewan made all these hybrids, and now it's a cottage industry in Saskatchewan. Well, um, I, they bloom too early for Colorado. So they come out really early bloom, on, you know, because we have these nice weeks of 40, 50, 60 degree weather, and then it's down to zero again. So they just... They're not so good, but up here, I think the closer you are to Canada, the better that you, I would try them. I would try those and, and see. And if you see that, if you go out there, you can see that they bloom really super early. And if you see, oh man, it's gonna be zero, you could try to cover them up. And, and cause you know, like those Canadian, or those um, apricots, for instance, are, uh, from Manchuria, and that's 50 below zero. But in China, it stays winter for a long time, and then it becomes spring. Where well, here it's winter, spring, winter, spring. <laughs> 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 yeah, so it might be hard, might be harder, but it's worth trying still. I was excited about it. Yes. Do you use a lot of gypsum on your stuff? No, I don't use any gypsum. No gypsum? No. Nope. Gypsum is uh, it's like calcium sulfate, I think is what it is. And it's my horticulture teacher, I remember this from, you know, when I was young. He said, gypsum's a gyp <laughs> for our climate and our soil conditions because gypsum's used because it's got the sulfate in it. It's a good way to, um, to um, acidify and add calcium to, you know, is, what is it? It's a... Uh, Said calcium to um, acid soils. Where here we already got um, alkaline soils, so it's, it's not necessary. So if you are going to, and we have plenty of calcium usually in our soils, so don't need any gypsum. So we, and oh yeah, so gypsum is used to uh, make acid soils more alkaline, and we are already alkaline, so you, that's what it is. So you don't need to do that. It's something that we learned back this year from the East. Uh, my question is not about my trees, but you know, I, I have artichokes in my garden, uh -huh. and I cover them up every year. How long am I going to be able to get those to stay? I mean, this will be my third year with the, the three plants I get. Man, I get big artichokes, hmm. and I cover them up with straw every year. And how, how many years are those going to last? Until... The uh, 50 below zero comes. Until winter comes back. Until, <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm really impressed by that. Uh, that this is, is my third, this will be my third year. Last year I had so many artichokes, it wasn't funny. But I cover them up really good with straw and then I put a tarp over them. Yeah. Now, am I going to be able to save that for four you, or five years? You may or? well be able to do that. So he's growing successfully artichokes, which have no business living here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've heard people doing it. Sure. I have heard people doing it by, by just you know, covering it up with straw like you did, and because they're they're perennials in California, and they come back year after year after year. So this will be his third year. Yeah. But there's a variety. I was reading in a horticulture magazine, Horticultural Science back in the 80s, about uh, annual artichoke culture. And it was, um, you grew the variety called Green Globe, and you started them inside in fe early February. So by the time you planted them out, they were big already. And then they would, they would just give you that big king choke and then a few side chokes. Yeah. And, and then you just let them die. But 
I had read that you could keep them alive, and so I tried it um, by digging them up and putting them in a greenhouse, uh -huh. but they didn't make it. Even in a greenhouse, I must have heard them when I dug them. But keep doing what you're doing. It's very really interesting. I, sometimes I got just two of them there. Sometimes I'll get 15 artichokes off of one plant. Yeah, that's really, that's impressive. Yes? Okay, um, on the uh, Rocky Mountain Juniper, you know, we we're looking for a screen, so it sounds like this might be good. But I don't want them, you know, 25 feet tall. If, if I would cut them, you know, top them, is that going to mess up the apical dominance? Oh, you know, you, no, you can just cut them off. It'll kind of make them look weird for a while, okay. but they, you could still, you know, like juniper hedges. Okay. Have you, if you ever come down to Fort Collins and you drive an I-25 and you kind of buy around the Budweiser plant mm -hmm. between Wellington and Fort Collins, on the east side of the road there's a golf course that these guys made a, a tall hedge, like 15 feet tall of mm -hmm. junipers. Okay. And they just hedge it like you were in England or something like that. <laughs> and so, so many people stopped by and said, how did you do, what is this? Yeah. And so he just made a sign. <laughs> so people <laughs> would stop. <laughs> and they use a variety that's called Wichita Blue. And, and he, he just prunes it every year. And so it, it's probably about this wide. Uh -huh. And it works really well. He, you know, he's a, he had a nursery, so he knew what he was doing. So they the Wichita are Blue? Yeah, Wichita blue. blue, but Wichita Blue, if you leave it on its own, it will be 12 feet wide and 20 feet tall. Thank you. You're welcome.